on today's episode of the McCann Dogs Podcast. With trick training and early trick training, I can start the established idea that working for me and engaging with me is a really, really valuable thing, and it brings lots of value to their lives. The McCann Dogs Podcast is brought to you by McCann Professional Dog Trainers. We help dog owners to have a well-behaved, four-legged family member. And now, Instructor Shannon. We need to talk about the power of trick training. I am here in the studio with Instructor Swanee. Hi, Swanee. Hi, everyone. (laughs) So nice to be here with you today. Mm -hmm. And if you listened to our most recent episode before this, we talked about vacations. Yes. And we haven't gone on vacation since that last episode. No, no, not yet. Those plans are still in the works. But if you are planning your vacation, check out that episode because we talked all about the things that you'll want to make sure that you plan for if you are bringing your dog or if you're leaving your dog behind and mm-hmm. things to make sure that you cover when you leave them with a, with a trusted friend or a pet sitter mm-hmm. or in a kennel. We are talking about the power of trick training. And I specifically say power because trick training is a really, really powerful thing that often gets taken for granted, mm-hmm. you know, and, and certainly that light fun side of tricks where we just enjoy training our dogs Mm -hmm. in tricks or we enjoy having them show off their tricks is a very wonderful and powerful thing but Mm -hmm. there is so much more so much more to trick training Mm -hmm. so what is before we get into it what is the favorite trick that you've ever taught your dogs well one of my favorite tricks is honda the dog i have right now he will army crawl backwards oh that's a good one he'll keep going forever and ever i bet i could get him to crawl backwards an entire football field. The like he just loves it. He, amazing. Yeah, and he just so quick going backwards. <laughs> that's adorable. I just love that trick. Yes. I love it. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. And how did you teach that? It was a, a few things taught it, okay. but um, uh, he does it when I show him a closed fist. Okay. So when I show him a closed fist, he just drops to the ground and he just starts to go backwards really fast in a straight line and just keeps going. Okay. Yes. So is it something that he just offered naturally and it, you captured it, it? Well, it was. So um, to, to teach him not to snatch food from my hands, I would put the food in a closed fist okay. and I would hold my fist. And, you know, being a puppy, he would lick my fist and that didn't make the fist open. He would bite at my fist. Mm-hmm. That didn't make it open. And then he sat back to pause to say, well, how do I get this fist to open? So the moment he brought his nose off my fist, I said, yes opened up my my hand and let him get the treat nice. so he learned that backing away from my fist was Resulted how to get the, in food. the reward. nice and then it just turned into teaching him how to crawl backwards by him saying okay you got a treat in there okay i'll back off two inches that didn't work i'll back off a foot that didn't work okay now i'm four feet away does that work yeah that does work and i toss him the treat nice. so he just keeps backing up in the hopes that he's far enough away from the fist to get the treat Fabulous. I love that. Yeah, it was something I didn't set off to teach him, but it was something that he started offering. And I thought, wow, this is fun. My favorite trick that I've ever taught was sneezing on command. And I did that by, you know, just every time it would occur naturally, I would yes and reward. And Mm -hmm. then over time, Jaden, it was Jaden that did this on command. He realized that he could make himself sneeze. And it really wasn't a true sneeze. It was Uh more him just backwards exhaling through his nose in a loud way. Uh But he figured out that this action got him rewards. And then once we got to the point where he was offering that behavior, Mm -hmm. I would start to cue it just beforehand so I would say um at you right and then he would sneeze after that so I timed it well so that I could add that command to it and yeah that's probably the favorite trick that I've ever taught my dog but I absolutely love teaching tricks so much and and Ned and Reggie both have those are the two dogs that I have right now Mm -hmm. they both have a huge repertoire of tricks that Mm -hmm. go from you know spins and and unwinds and Mm -hmm. sore paws and limping and (laughs) the the backwards um circles around me that I call a donut for some reason I'm Uh not really sure why but if you can picture like a a swimming donut that would go around your body he goes backwards around me like that donut so in that path (laughs) I guess that's probably what the method to my madness was when I named that it doesn't matter what you call it yeah exactly Mm. exactly as long as he does it and does it well and enjoys it right I am happy with whatever name but I also used to do um 
with Jaden, he did head down on you should be ashamed. Oh. So I would say in when we were showing off tricks right, to our yeah. puppy essentials class on mm-hmm. week three, I would say you should be ashamed. And he would put his head down in the most adorable way. Right, and of yes. course, even though that was uh, uh, not a very hard trick to teach, uh-huh. it absolutely brought joy to everybody in the class to see this dog pretend to be ashamed of course so entertainment value Mm -hmm. with tricks is huge Mm. and that actually um that will branch off to you know kids who are a little bit uncertain about dogs for example Mm -hmm. we'll do a lot of um a lot of community events a lot of things where kids will be interested in the dogs they might not have dogs of of their own Mm -hmm. and they might not be super familiar with dogs and sometimes they're a little bit put off by the dogs and we have a lot of big dogs around Mm -hmm. McCann's we have a lot of little dogs around McCann's as well but sometimes the big dogs can be a little overwhelming for kids and for people who aren't maybe used to dogs Mm -hmm. and aren't uh aren't entirely comfortable with them showing off some tricks oh right yes bridges that gap so beautifully yeah I have an example my um um my Saluki cowboy was in an opera production of Aida and after remember that after the opening night there was like a gala Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, as one of the stars, she was uh, at the gala. And, uh, you know, there's people, you know, well-dressed, milling about. Not everyone's a dog person. And, uh, of course, there was there was snacks, like, you know, cheese and crackers and, and all that. And Cowboy was seeing all these people going by, and she knew that she would get a, you know, she got treats for tricks. And <laughs> so her, her go-to trick was always offering a paw to people. Okay. And I was just, she did this on her own. So, uh, you know, we would be milling about in the crowd and suddenly she would sit and offer her paw to a person. And people were delighted Aww. that, you know, they didn't realize that she was just trying to get their cheese. Yes. She thought, you know, people thought that, look, this dog wants to shake my hand. Like Absolutely. this was one of the stars of the show and she wants to shake my hand and interact with me. And, uh, you know, people just loved it. They just love, and I was so proud of her. I just bet. so proud of her to offer that. To and people. how lovely and mannerly of her to walk up and very politely say, yes. "It's nice to meet you," instead of walking up and jumping exactly. on them for their cheese yes. or yes. you know bopping them in the crotch right. or something of that nature. She right. had this go-to behavior. I yes. love that. It, That's it was so just good. yeah. It was just that yeah. You know, some dogs are are one in a million, and yes. she was. She was one of them, yes. She was definitely a very special dog. Uh And Salukis are a fairly rare breed. They also can be a little bit primitive still. So having this wonderful personality that she had, she was a very special girl. She was all dressed up as an Egyptian dog, and she had uh, um, uh, wrappings on her legs and um, a huge collar with tassels and beading. And she just looked, she just looked so elegant. Beautiful. Yes. <laughs> I love it. That's so fun. So yeah, and this is a great, this is a great segue into one of the reasons that training tricks is such a great thing. And that is the communication factor. Mm-hmm. So when we, we, we get our dogs and we of course have this, um, have this idea of all the obedience skills that we're going to teach them, etc. Right. And basically teaching our dogs and training our dogs is all about communication. And it's all about teaching them how to understand us. So what better way than to have all these different behaviors that Mm -hmm. we can teach in the form of tricks? And even though it seems like something that we're just doing for fun, Mm -hmm. it's actually bridging that gap of communication so nicely to be teaching our dogs tricks. And it to helps us become much more, much more um, well versed mm-hmm. in the methods that we use to right. teach our dogs. And to our dogs, there's really not a huge difference between us, us teaching them a shake a paw and us teaching them to walk nicely on a leash. Right. You know, from mm-hmm. their perspective, they're all just behaviors. They're yeah. all just tricks, quote mm-hmm. unquote tricks. We put more importance on some of them than on others, mm-hmm. but truly, it's all about communication and yes. it's all about creating a system of learning for our dogs. Mm-hmm. And with tricks, one of the things that is really nice about them is you can start immediately. It's yes. one of the first things that I start with my youngsters mm-hmm. when they come home. Right. Um, I'm expecting a puppy hopefully in a few months and mm-hmm. I guarantee you that that puppy will have a whole bunch of trick behaviors before mm-hmm. the, the puppy really has any true obedience skills. Right. They'll have been started mm-hmm. with their obedience skills. I always start with things like out, especially yeah. with a young toller. Right. They're always wanting to pick everything right. up. Yeah. So one of the first things I teach is a good solid out. Mm -hmm. understanding I teach a good solid response to name and Mm -hmm. I teach tricks right off the bat what are some of the tricks that you teach early on in the process with your youngsters well I think with with a young puppy 
I, I start with the basic tricks, kind of the shake a paw, which can turn into a high five and mm-hmm. a sore paw. Um, I'll teach the spins. Okay. Um, run between my legs. Mm-hmm. Um, crawl underneath a low stool. Put your feet up on a stool. Just kind of the, the basic ones that are, are easy for the puppy to be successful to learn. Perfect. And as the puppy starts to understand how to learn because we have to teach our puppies how to learn you know i'm going to go on to things like roll over get them getting them to lie down and to start learning how to crawl a little bit crawl love forward that. um so i'm going to start easy and then slowly build yeah i love that and what we're doing with these tricks is we're teaching our dogs to enjoy engaging with mm-hmm. us and enjoy yes. training and we're teaching them that it's very valuable to do so yeah so the last thing i want to do is just go out there in the real world and expect my dog to look to me and go oh you're this wonderful entity in my life because chances are when I'm out there in the real world they're looking at the things that are moving around them Mm -hmm. they're sniffing at the grass they're looking at the critters you know they're building value for everything else in their life Mm -hmm. with trick training and early trick training I can start the established idea that working for me and engaging with me is Mm -hmm. a really really valuable thing And it brings lots of value to their lives. So then out there in the real world, I have a much better chance of them saying, hey, what do you got for me? Mm -hmm. Rather than just trying to soak in their, um, all of their enrichment from the environment. Want to wow your friends at your next house party? Teach your dog to walk on your feet with instructor Steve over on the McCann Dogs Training YouTube channel. Have fun. You had mentioned a few tricks there, and I want to talk about methods as well, because this is another really, really good reason to teach tricks, right. is to get yourself well-versed mm-hmm. and to get your dog's learning systems well-versed right. on the different methods of training. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that you talked about was like the shake a paw and the crawling behavior, and right. those are traditionally taught through luring. Right. Luring is basically showing the dog that I have some food mm-hmm. and you can follow that food, and then that will result in you eventually getting that food when right. you accomplish certain things. Things. And we do this for a lot of physical skills, sits down, stands, mm-hmm. that sort of idea. We will teach through luring. So having, a, and even though it seems like something that a dog would automatically understand, there's food, I follow it. A lot of the times they don't. They right. have a yes. hard time picking up on this idea because of course with a dog, see food, eat food. Mm-hmm. There's not this magical system that they have for follow food. So right. we teach them with the luring method, how mm. to nicely follow the food, how to not take our fingers off right. yep. and how to understand that the, the goal is that they follow the food rather than just trying to snatch the right. food. Like the donkey following the carrot. Exactly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and I we, wonder if that's ever really been done. We say that. <laughs> Isn't, wasn't it like the, the there's like an attachment to the right, donkey's yeah. collar and then the carrot just dangles right, in front yes. of them so and there's not actually just, somebody with the right, carrot? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if that was really done. Maybe. It kept the donkey huh, well, moving forward. Yeah, Poor any frustrated watch, if, donkey though. Yes. If any watchers have any, know anything about that, please send us a message. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. We'd love to know now actually. Right, yes. So yeah, the whole donkey and carrot routine, it comes in very handy with our puppies for the luring behavior. Right. And then and there is a couple of other methods that we can use. There's lots of methods actually that we can use, but mm-hmm. we're going to touch on two other methods here. Uh, one of them being capturing, capturing which we talked yeah. a little bit right, about yes, already, yes. just waiting for a behavior to occur and right. then marking that behavior. Mm-hmm. And then of course, some of you may or may not be familiar with the idea of shaping mm-hmm. and shaping being a, being a conditioning behavior that basically asks our dogs to give us a little bit more each and every time. It's basically right. successive approximations of behavior. Mm-hmm. So you might might, for example, want your dog to run a circle around a chair, you wouldn't start by expecting them to run a circle around the chair because chances are the dog's not going to Mm. offer that right off the bat. Um, But you might start by rewarding when they glance at the chair and then rewarding when they glance and move a step towards Mm -hmm. the chair and then rewarding when they glance, move and start to circle the chair, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So basically we're looking for tiny little incremental improvements towards our end goal with the dog. And with shaping, oh my goodness, there are so many amazing behaviors that you can teach through shaping because basically what you're doing is saying to the dog, do something right. for me. Yes. Show me something. And if I find it to be valuable or on track mm-hmm. for what I want you to do, I'm going to reward that. Yes. But here's the kicker. 
I find with shaping, a lot of the times I start off with a plan uh-huh. and then my plan evolves into something completely right. different yes, than I what I was exactly expecting it to yes. be in the first place, right. which I love. Yes, I love it when I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to start with asking my dog to do a circle around this chair mm-hmm. and then in that process, my dog doesn't necessarily circle around the chair. Maybe he decides to offer going underneath the chair. Right, and yeah. I might think, that's a cool that's trick. Better, yeah. That's even yeah. better. So now I rewrote what I was trying to do and I start rewarding the um, attempts to go underneath the chair. Right. Or maybe my dog decides to be really cute and put his front paws up on the mm-hmm. chair. I might decide, you know what, I'm going to abandon having him go around right, the chair yeah. and I'm going to keep working on this paws up behavior on mm-hmm. the chair. And then, you know, maybe I shape the paws up and the head down on the chair and I've got like a little, little dog praying on the chair right, and that yeah. looks really cute. There's all sorts of ways you can take right. that shaping behavior yes. and you can ask your dog for different things and mm-hmm. you can end up on a different path and with all sorts of creative ways right. of yes. teaching those tricks. So I know that you have lots of experience with shaping. So what's one of the one, one of your favorite things that you've taught with shaping? Well, I taught actually Honda to uh, ride a skateboard with shaping. Nice. Yes, that's yes. fun. And it took, it took quite a while. Um, because, well, you know, he offered the getting up on the skateboard behavior quite naturally, but to get him to start to get his foot down to push himself off. Okay. So it it took quite a while, but, um, yeah, Honda is quite a good little skateboard rider. That's through shaping. Yes. So much fun. And sometimes these are things that you can sort of, you can teach with luring if you want to, but... With something like skateboarding, for example, there's a certain confidence that comes along Mm -hmm. with the dog offering the behavior rather than being sort of quote unquote coerced into the behavior. So a lot of the times, even though you can use this method of luring to Mm -hmm. teach this thing, you're actually better off to use this method of shaping or this method of capturing. And we know that when we allow our dogs to make choices and we allow them to problem solve and think through, we know that one, that is incredible for their overall learning systems Mm -hmm. and understanding, but we also know that it's a very powerful thing for them and it's very reinforcing for them when they offer us something and we go, oh, you are so right, so smart, Mm -hmm. you're brilliant, here's a cookie, you did great. That's a really powerful thing for dogs. So if we can get them into that mindset Mm -hmm. of saying, you know what? I want to be operant and I want to engage with you and I want to offer this nice behavior and Mm -hmm. that nice behavior in this scenario and we're looking for that what we can do is we can capture that good behavior. So as an example, if my dog is used to the idea that, uh, you know, sometimes they offer me this thing and they get rewarded for it, maybe my dog goes to the back door and sits at the back door and I say, yes, what a smart dog. Mm -hmm. And I reward that. And now I have a system of him telling me when he needs to go outside. You know, it's, it's always a good thing to have my dog thinking, where is the value in this situation? Right. How do I tap into the value? Mm -hmm. What can I do for you to earn value in this scenario because in day-to-day life our dogs are always learning right so if we don't have these things in Mm -hmm. place where our dogs saying okay what can i do what would you like me to do Mm -hmm. they're working for themselves they're thinking about what can i do for me what do i want to do to bring value to my life and that might be chewing on the coffee table leg that might be you know it might be all sorts of things with a young dog Mm -hmm. that don't necessarily align with what we want them to do yes i found with uh cowboy my saluki Mm -hmm. salukis aren't a braid that's traditionally known in obedience circles they're Mm -hmm. you know they're very similar to an afghan hound they're they're intelligent but independent thinkers and i found that Talk about what they're bred to do, just so that... Uh, Salukis are bred basically to to hunt things that are running. Mm-hmm. So the uh, the Bedouins um, in the uh, Middle East would, um, you know, keep Salukis basically to make sure they have meat for their family. And uh, they basically let go of the Salukis, and the Salukis, completely on their own, will chase down a, a hare okay. or um, a desert rat or, or something that's out there and uh, make the kill. And, uh, you know, they take no instruction from the, the people. So they've been, they've been around for, you know, thousands of years, Salukis. So they're, they're not bred to listen to people. Right. They're bred to work on their own and. And be more self-serving. So right. I, I, just as a, as a curiosity, how do the, um, how do the, the people end up getting the hair back from the Saluki? Do they chase the Saluki down to get it? They or? usually, back, back in the day, they'd follow on horseback. Okay. So they follow on horseback and well, well, the Saluki is 
is shaking, they, they would just get off right away and, okay. and, and pick up the Saluki generally. Okay. Yes. And they usually have fairly short bursts of energy too. Right. So I would imagine after the hunt and yes. the, and the, and the grab des- and the kill, they're probably easier to manage yes. at that and, point. And the, the desert heat too is so hot. Uh, so the gotcha. dog's basically exhausted. So they're... So it's not even like I hunt, I kill, I bring it back to you. It's no, I hunt, they would, I kill, and then you they, come no, and get No, no, they basically come and they they take they need to take the rabbit from okay. the saluki. The saluki would never ever in a thousand bajillion years bring it back to them. Okay, <laughs> alrighty. So that that makes sense. I just wanted right. to I just wanted to set the scene for like the sort of self serving, self driven right. yes. nature yes. of the dog. And you yes. were going to uh, so I, I, I found that you. shape. Oh no, no, it's okay. Shaping um, gave cowboy that. <laughs> that feeling that she was somewhat in charge. It's like, I'm going to go, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I taught her to tap a spot on the wall with her nose. And so she would run over and tap the spot with her nose and then say, you got to give me a treat now because I, I did the right thing. Um, so it kind of, you know, in, even though I was in charge, she kind of had a little bit of power. It's like, uh, I also taught her when I called her to come she was uh, at belly button height for me when she sat. Okay. To, uh, poke my belly button with her nose to get the treat. <laughs> that way she was nice and close. So she would come and run. She would sit in front and poke my belly button. And then she'd say, okay, give me the goods. Give me the goods. I did this. <laughs> and it's like, she thought she was in charge, yeah. but really I was in charge. Oh, yes. And I love it. And this is how we help to align the things that our dogs want to do with the things that we want them to do. Right. Instead of them running their own show and their own idea and us chasing them around and trying to get them on side with us. Mm-hmm. It, this is a way of making it make sense for them. This is a way of building value for the right. things that we want them to do mm-hmm. by putting these learning systems in place and all of these behaviors that come along with shaping, that come along with teaching a dog to be a thinking dog and right. to offer you behaviors and to think about what might bring them value mm-hmm. in this situation, they are going to pay off in your day-to-day obedience as right. well as with your trick training. Interested in teaching your dog new tricks? Join us online for our limited time trick bundle, which includes cross your feet and trick shaping workshops. More information in the description below. I think that tricks are absolutely one of the best ways to start building confidence right. and also building a relationship Because you have this thing where, you know what, truly, Mm -hmm. if my dog doesn't roll over when I'm trying to teach him to roll over, Mm -hmm. I don't care. There's no consequence for that. There's no, there's no consequence for me. There's no consequence for my dog. The Mm -hmm. only thing that happens is that they don't get to the end of that trick yet. Right. You know, whereas with a recall, you have to, you have to come when you're called and I'm going to be, you know, really diligent about teaching Mm -hmm. that and making sure that my dog minimizes getting it wrong, maximizes Mm -hmm. getting it right, knows what the process is and knows that there's a consequence eventually once we get to that point in our recall, knows that there's a consequence for ignoring that recall. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain amount of pressure that comes along with teaching those skills and those obedience skills that are really important life-saving skills. Whereas with tricks, Right. And it's you, so loosey goosey. I see the difference when I'm uh, instructing our in person classes. Mm-hmm. So, our in person uh, life skills classes are, are, are life skills that the dog needs to learn. And, um, you know, the, you know people are, are training and, and they're serious and they're working with their dog. But then when we have our, our parkour classes or our yeah. trick classes, people have the biggest smiles and are chatty and. It's just such a great, like a, a community. We have a, yeah. a community right there. Amazing. And people we do. Are, are more apt to share. Yes. So we, I always try in our, in our life skills classes, let's try to, you know, lighten up everyone. Let's, you know, have some yeah. more fun with this and because I see it come so naturally in tricks and parkour. Yes, as opposed to when we're teaching our dogs to stay or, yes. or lie down or to come. Yes. Yeah, and it's so important to have both. It's so important to have a balance of everything, but tricks have such a strong role to play in our mm-hmm. dog training. And I love this. And and it's absolutely true. You don't feel the pressure with right. tricks because yes. if the end result doesn't come or it, it evolves into something else, who cares? Right, exactly. <laughs> who cares yes. if I end up with a sit pretty instead of a rollover? Although I don't really know how that would happen. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have been on a weird yeah <laughs> but regardless right i'm okay with it because right. you know what it, it, i didn't need to get to any sort of end goal product there's nothing that's going to be life-saving for my dog right. by teaching them a rollover so mm-hmm. i mean this is a wonderful way of bridging that gap right. of communication and also 
here's the the buzzword building relationship. Right. Yes. You know, it yes. really it does. Relationship is built based on fair understanding and communication. Mm-hmm. It is not built based on being a tyrant. It's not built based on being lovey-dovey with the puppy. Mm-hmm. It is based on giving them good, clear direction. Right. Yeah. It's based on teaching them that Mm -hmm. when the chips are down and when they're stressed and when there's something that they need out of life, Mm -hmm. they need to look to us. Right. You know, though, those are the things that we want out of good leadership. We don't want puppies or dogs that are afraid of us because Mm -hmm. we're militant and we Mm -hmm. don't want puppies or dogs that all they think that we're good for is snuggles and love. We want puppies and dogs that look to us and think, You've got my back. I know that if I'm scared in this situation, I look to you instead of running off Mm -hmm. because I'm worried about saving myself. I know that if I am feeling bold in a situation where I need to settle that, uh, you know, I can look to all of my dogs and I can change their behavior very Mm -hmm. quickly based on the communication that we've created and based on the leadership that I give them. And that is all good relationship. The more you can work with your dogs in these situations that don't necessarily have the pressure, the more you can open the lines of communication, right. the better your relationship will end up being mm-hmm. for that. So that's yes. one of the the biggest reasons that I love tricks yes. is the relationship that it builds. And you really see that blossoming with you, you blossoming yes. with your young puppies. Yes. I've often, I've also found it, it's been really good uh, when my son was little because mm-hmm. my, my son was able to teach the dog some tricks with my supervision, of course. Yes. And just that so much helped his relationship when he was the, I was coaching him and he was working with the puppy and all of a sudden he says, I taught cowboy how to shake a paw. And it's like, I you did, it. Ty, you taught, you taught cowboy that. Aww. And, uh, you know, it just, it gives the, the child and the dog so much more value to each other. Yes. And, um, you know, or even if you have a, like an elderly family member, like, you know, coach them on how to teach the dog a few tricks. Like, you know, like I hope when I'm older, my son has a puppy and, you know, lets me do some tricks with oh, that You'll dog. never be old, elderly. Never. Never, I hope. Well, you'll always be young. <laughs> youthful and young. Well, I might be elderly on the outside, but youthful on the inside. <laughs> you yes. But, uh, you, you know, what What a great thing to, uh, you know, take a family member who's not really involved with the dog and have them coach them through yeah. teaching a, a shaping a trick or luring a trick. Uh, it just... Yeah, it's just wonderful. Absolutely. I love that. And with our kids especially, mm-hmm. there's this confusion about how kids and dogs should interact in, in our lives and in society. And a lot of the times, you know, these videos that you see of the dog laying there and the child Ooh. crawling all over them or pulling tails and pulling ears. Right. And, you know, inevitably there's a parent saying, look how tolerant the dog is. And those of us that read body language in dogs well yes. think, you know, you're a hair trigger away from a bite in that situation and of course the dog is learning that the child is you know bringing pain and Mm -hmm. it's not a good scenario and the child is learning that the dog is their trampoline and those are not good lessons for either it's so much nicer if the dog has good clear communication with the child and understands how to read them and understands that they bring good things and tricks are fantastic way of helping to bridge that gap with kids right yes like i when my son was little like i taught him to respect all animals and animals are not toys we we don't touch them we don't yes and i think um i think that's carried over into his life that uh, us be very respectful of animals in nature so i i worry about you know children who are allowed to climb over dogs and sit on dogs like what what lessons are we teaching our children absolutely and and generally children are not interested in teaching obedience skills to the dogs nor are they always capable of teaching Mm -hmm. obedience skills to the dogs so tricks are a great way of bridging that you know they can work on shake a paws and high fives and things like that right and they can start to build some wonder over the idea that these are 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 really smart creatures that we're living with and they have feelings i know Mm -hmm. we did an episode on kids and dogs a few episodes ago and you had some really amazing insight with uh, some of the lessons the early lessons that you you taught Ty with regards to the dogs and yeah it was a great episode Mm. Um, and so I think so important especially now when there's so much opportunity for danger to happen mm-hmm. with with people having kids and dogs at the same time. Right. We need to make sure that it's a mutually respected relationship mm-hmm. that's happening. So I love the idea of using tricks for that. Love right. it. Yes. Yeah. And it's something the kids can show off to their um, 
yes. their friends. Like I remember uh, picking up Ty from school with Cowboy, and um, you know Ty would show his friends her tricks that she oh, does. I bet, I bet and, he was so uh, proud. Yeah, he he just loved that, and um, so it is. It, it's it's yes. it's something that you can you know show your family. You can you know. It's something you can do anywhere. I do it at the vet's clinic. While we're waiting, the dogs are worried. They're like, oh, what's going to happen to us yep. today at the vet clinic? But instead, I bring a pocket of treats, and we shake a paw. We do some spins. We, you know, jump up into my lap. We jump off my lap. And uh, they're, like, engaged. Yeah. So they don't have time to worry. Absolutely. And it does help to build their confidence because mm -hmm. they get this, you know, little endorphin rush for getting the right trick or earning the treats, et cetera. And now this place that mm -hmm. sometimes can be a little bit scary with the poking and the prodding, et cetera. Right is not really so bad and they also have things that are familiar to bring into that environment and mm -hmm. build comfort for them as well listen to instructor shannon and instructor swanee discuss the essential guide to raising kids and puppies together on the mccann dogs podcast available on spotify apple Podcasts, and youtube the other thing that i wanted to talk about when it comes to tricks is the enrichment factor uh for people who are especially working with young dogs, a lot of the times they need more mental enrichment. Yes. And a lot of the times people will search to the ends of the world for the next great enrichment activity. And I always consider there to be two types of enrichment. There's enrichments from what I call column A, which are good enrichments that are going to enhance your relationship and help your dog learn things as well as taking some of the mental energy out of them and mm -hmm. helping to calm them and create create a calmer dog in the house or right. a calmer young puppy. Uh, a lot of the times the physical exercise just doesn't do it. And we talk about physical exercise building the need for more physical exercise just mm -hmm. like when we go to the gym right. you know the idea is that today I can do 10 minutes worth yep. of cardio and tomorrow I can do 11 and then the next day 12 etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. some of you are probably faster than me at jumping <laughs> up in your cardio <laughs> numbers but hopefully the hopefully right. the point is yeah. made that basically we're conditioning an athlete when we try to tire our dogs out mm -hmm. by only doing physical things with them right Adding some mental enrichment is a huge way of helping to calm the brain mm -hmm. and take things down a little bit. And those enrichments from column A are things that involve me. They're things that make my dog look to me for engagement. They're things that make me a really positive factor in the dog's life. The enrichments from column B are things that only enrich the dog and in a way that is very self-serving. So those would be like the snuffle mats and things like the treat bowls. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there's all sorts of um, other uh, uh, examples on the list, doggy daycares and playing with other dogs, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are, yes, they're enriching for mm -hmm. the dog. And they're certainly good to fill in a little gap sometimes. I use those when, you know, I've had really busy days and right. I want to make sure that my dogs, you know, still get some, still get some mental stimulation or some sniff work or, right. you know, they might, I might use a snuffle mat in that scenario right. and I, I can use i like to use snuffle mats and make sure the dog sees me putting the treats in. okay yeah so that's I'll a like, good thought i'll let them watch me hide every treat and then i'll put it on the floor and i'll often sit right beside them so i'm still sort of part of it and yeah, then when they're good. when they're found them all I'll say oh i'm putting some more in now and they have to sit and wait and I put some more in. So I try to make me part of the yes. snuffle mat. I love that. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, it, it's so important that the enrichment is not just this constant self-serving enrichment. So all of those things, while they're, they're not horrible, mm -hmm. They're not great for relationship and they're also, they can actually work against relationship because unless you're doing it like you were, mm -hmm. Your dog is getting all of that reinforcement without you having anything to do with it. So right. it can actually work against your relationship mm -hmm. and make everything else in the environment more valuable and make sort of being that self-serving dog mm -hmm. a more valuable and more approachable thing for the dog. Whereas when I want to enrich my youngsters, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when I've got a young puppy in the house and I'm thinking, okay, I need to drain some energy or I want to work with this right. dog, I go to tricks right away. Right. Yeah. And that enrichment mm -hmm. factor training is like the enrich, the original dog enrichment. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, yeah. we've gone to looking for external sources and right. I always consider those to be like the video games, right? So mm -hmm. if you have a child in the house, you want to do a lot of engagement with the child with you. You want to spend time with the child. Mm -hmm. You want to have activities planned for you and the child to bond and have these family moments. Right. You might still have video games in your life. Mm -hmm. But in a perfect world, they're a very small component of things. Right. And your, your child is not, you know, 
is not living and breathing just to be enriched by that video game or that other mm -hmm. addictive substance that is not necessarily anything to right. do with you that's right. going to benefit your relationship. Mm -hmm. So I like to think about um, those enrichment activities as like the video games, maybe, maybe the occasional babysitter. But for the most part, I want my dogs getting their enrichment and their engagement and like all the mental activity and the physical stimulation. I want it all to sort of be predicated on me right. because then my dog looks to me in those relationship situations. Right. And I know that that sounds like a really overwhelming concept, but it's actually not. Mm -hmm. And especially if you use things like trick training mm -hmm. where I can do a 10 minute trick training session with my puppy and they're going to be exhausted at the end of it. Whereas if I went out and, you know, threw a toy for them 20 times, they might still have another 20 more retrieves in them. Or that exercise might actually increase by making them overstimulated. It might actually increase the output of energy and then they get to the point where they kind of crash. And it's really not a healthy way mm -hmm. of dealing with their energy. We want to try to keep them as even as possible. So the mental work mm -hmm. makes a huge difference right. with things. Yes, definitely. So, uh, something I liked with my Sheltie Atari mm -hmm. is I taught her to, um, I bought a, uh, a big plastic kind of like beach ball, children's ball from Walmart. Okay. And I taught her to push it with her nose. Oh, fun. And so I was able to combine pushing that around and exercise. So it was mental exercise because we would push it out and she would have to push it back to me or it would get, you know, caught somewhere and she would work so hard with her little nose trying to get it out from behind the bushes. Aww. And uh, and still, and she's running too. So it, yeah. it combined both. And she loved that game. She I would, bet. we kept that ball up on a shelf and we would go out and she would stare at that shelf. Like, please, please, Christine, can we play this game? I uh, love this game. And it involved me, it involved her, it involved thinking, it involved exercise. And it's funny, uh, we lost uh, Atari back in the fall. She was only six, so it was uh, quite oh. sudden. That ball is still up on that shelf. Oh my gosh. It's still, I don't have the heart to bring that ball down. I completely understand. Yes. It needs to stay there. It's it's yes. a special thing. Yes. So before you start crying. I know, I'm tearing it's, up now. It's, <laughs> it's so hard to lose them when they're that young. Yes. Oh my gosh, I can't. I'm, I've been very lucky to have all old lip dogs, mm -hmm. so I do not envy your position, but let's talk about why the ball was on the shelf to begin with. Well, we put the ball up on the shelf because it was a special ball that only her and I, or her and my partner would interact with. Perfect. So that was a ball for us. And it created that, I want to do stuff with you. Mm -hmm. And there it is. And it created anticipation too, because she could see that ball up there. Yeah. And she'd be like, oh, I just, I, I adore that game. And, um, you know, she was a dog that, you know, like most of my dogs, I take to the park. If I take her off leash, she doesn't run off. She turns and looks at me like, what are we doing? Yes. This is exactly. awesome. What are we doing? Yeah. So, um, you know, that... You know, we kept that ball up there and, uh, you know, and often she would ask to play with it by staring and I'd say, of course that. we can play with that and yeah. we'd get it down and yeah. Yeah. And if that ball had just been in the middle of the yard all the time, what do you think would have happened? Oh, it would have lost... It would have lost its magic. Yeah, yeah it that's exactly lost its magic. it. Yes. So those of you who are thinking about uh, ways to build toy drive with your dogs, mm -hmm. that is one of the first and foremost rules that you'll want to follow is make sure that the toys that you're trying to build drive with are not accessible for your dogs right. all the time. They're not something that your dog can always access. They're something special. I will actually, when I'm working with a young dog and I'm trying to build some drive and some excitement about toys, I'll actually leave them on the fridge in my kitchen because already, when I go in the kitchen, the kitchen's usually an exciting place uh -huh. because dogs love to eat, of course, and right. they, they figure out pretty quickly that the kitchen is the source of food. Mm -hmm. So I go into the kitchen and I will creep Believe oh. go up to the fridge so I'm acting coy <laughs> and like ooh what are we doing right. what's happening in here and then I snatch the toy oh I just <laughs> I just hit my headphones um I snatch the toy off of the fridge I'm getting too excited right. here in the podcast yep. studio snatch the toy off the fridge and then I run around the kitchen a little bit or I run out into the living room throwing the toy and being mm. goofy and you know generally making my dog go what in the world are you doing let me play with that I want to play too this looks so much fun right. and then I might I might let them play for a bit and engage with me with this mm -hmm. toy and then work my out and then I tuck it back up on the fridge or I might just tease them a little bit and then tuck it back up on the fridge oh. and go oh next time maybe yes. I'll let you play too building anticipation exactly yes. and yes. it leaves the puppy wanting that toy right. more whereas if that toy is always just 
sitting in the middle of the living room mm-hmm. very quickly, it becomes the dusty thing that right. isn't really yes. exciting or the thing that my dog always has access to to play on right. his own. Yeah. So. S- same with your kids. If you have a toy that's always on the floor for them, it becomes old hat I thought after you meant put the kids up on the oh, fridge. The <laughs> <laughs> oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> yeah, but absolutely. If you, yeah, if you have a special toy for your children that uh, you know they can only have at certain times, that toy <laughs> has far more value than the toy they can access all the time. Yeah, absolutely. In all of that fun and in all of that enrichment, tricks play such a big part and a big role and they are so important for your overall relationship and training and communication style with your dog. Mm. So anything that I have missed in terms of the power of trick training and things that we want to talk about? I don't, I don't think so. I think, you know, and some people will, will poo poo tricks. Some trainers will poo poo tricks and, um, but can you say that again? (laughs) I just wanted to hear you say poo-poo tricks again. <laughs> poo-poo tricks. But, like, no, tricks Tricks are fun. Yes. Tricks are valuable. Tricks are dog training. They, Absolutely. They, yes, yes. I don't know why anyone would say a trick is yeah. not valuable. And there's so much value in having light things to work on with our dogs that don't have the pressure behind them and don't right. have the stress and we're not worried about making mistakes with, et cetera, et cetera. I think that uh, poo-pooing tricks is very short-sighted. Right, yes. And there's room, yeah, like there's, I can I just tra- want to keep saying yeah. that. <laughs> like, I've trained dogs to do some very serious yes. things. And, uh, you know, I've trained dogs to do tricks. Like, yep. it's, uh, you know, I'm, I have, lo- you know, I can do all of them. I can Absolutely. do them all, yes. Absolutely. Right? One does not take away from the other in right. any way. They enhance each other beautifully. Exactly, yes. Beautifully. Yes. We actually have um, a ton of trick tutorials on our YouTube channel if you're mm-hmm. looking for I- ideas for tricks. Lots of really good quick trick tutorials that will set you in motion for having a lot of fun tricks to play with your dogs. There's at least 25 up there in an old series called Trick Tuesday that right. uh, yeah. we used to yeah. do way back in the early days of our YouTube channel. Please forgive the early production value if you do look those up, uh-huh. but they are, the content is quite good. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And there's not, you know, like if you're, say you're checking into a hotel with your dog and there's some people looking at your dog and you can tell your dog to wave to them. Like, Adorable. oh my gosh, it blows their mind. Absolutely. Yes, like Absolutely. just, yeah. Even just the old balancing a cookie on the nose and saying, okay, get it. And the dog snatches it in the air. Yeah. Like, that's a fun trick. It's amazing how good at catching them they, they are. get. So yes. quickly, right. too. Yes. Amazing. Yes. Well, I think this has been a fun episode, and I hope you all get out there and train some tricks with your dogs. And then shoot a video of it. Post it somewhere. Tag us. We would absolutely love to see your trick training. We've got um, some groups on Facebook that Mm -hmm. are uh, free McCann Dogs training tips groups. And, of course, you're always welcome to tag McCann Dog Trainers on Facebook. Mm -hmm. All righty. This has been a fun episode. Yes, it has. Thank you for joining me. And on that note, I'm Instructor Shannon. I'm Instructor Christine. Happy training. This episode was brought to you by McCann Dogs Life Skills 1 where your dog will learn to come when called, walk nicely on a leash, ignore distractions, listen and respond to your voice commands quickly and happily, and stop jumping up on family and guests. Join us in person or online. For more information, please visit McCannDogs.com. Happy training!